what is the best way to relate to yourself in order to create the best existential foundation for you, the reality you build as an extension of yourself and the society that you create as a result. This is an existential conversation. When I talk about individualism versus collectivism, I'm talking about it from a purely existential standpoint. What up everybody, welcome back to Operation Moksha. As always, I am your host, Chris Rosco, and today we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite topics of all time ever, something that is pretty controversial and I'm sure it's probably gonna piss some of you off, but I honestly think this is one of the most important topics I could possibly be talking about. It's something that I think about a lot, it's something that's really near and dear to me and I have a lot of strong feelings about and hopefully I'll be able to articulate these feelings in a way where you will understand at least the relevancy of what I'm talking about, even if you don't full on agree with me. Hopefully it'll allow you to understand the importance of individualism so you can at least integrate it into your worldview, It'll, if not come to my side and see it as the proper existential starting place. So with that in mind, I do wanna get some stuff out of the way, right? Like this is not a political conversation, this is not an ideological conversation. I'm not interested in either of those two things. I don't give a fuck what your politics are. I don't give a fuck about your ideology. I think both of those things are morally and spiritually bankrupt and I want, don't want them anywhere near me. We do not care. So let me talk about what is an existential starting point in the first place. Right, so existentialism is largely the study of existence. And so when I talk about an existential starting point, I'm talking about what is the best way to relate to yourself as the top of your value hierarchy. Everybody has a hierarchy of values. There are things that you value more than others. Even me, who has an integrative mindset where I try and integrate the best parts of all the different ideologies and theologies and religions and spiritual practices and all these sorts of things, I try to integrate the best of everything, but I still have a hierarchy. There are still things that even though I see their value, some are more important than others. And I keep individualism at the top of my value hierarchy, and I'll go into all the reasons for that later on, but it's important to distinguish what this even is in the first place. A value hierarchy is how you organize your reality. Everybody has values, whether they acknowledge it or not, and your values dictate your behavior. What you truly value is what you will act upon. It's how you perceive and organize your reality on an internal level, and it also dictates your actions, your attitudes, the opportunities you see for yourself, the opportunities that you won't allow yourself to see for yourself, and a whole bunch of other factors. So the existential starting point is, this is primarily what I see myself as. Do I primarily, first and foremost, see myself as an individual, or do I primarily, first and foremost, see myself as part of a collective? This is gonna be one of the most important questions you ever ask yourself, and the answer to this question will have enormous implications on every single area of your life. It'll impact your mental health, it'll impact your confidence, it'll impact your relationships, it'll impact your career and whether or not you find any true sense of purpose or calling or a meaningful existence or anything like that. How you answer this question and how you go about answering this question will have enormous implications on every single area of your life, and I will go into why, but I just kinda of wanna frame what an existential starting point is first. If at the end of the day, do you first and foremost primarily see yourself as an individual or do you first and primarily see yourself as a member of a collective? And what are the pros and cons to each? What is the benefit and why would you choose one or the other? That's essentially what I wanna break down today. And as a result, I wanna to explain to you why I think that individualism is the proper existential starting point for all of us who have to share our world together. Now, again, it's not to say that collectivism doesn't have value, because I keep an integrative mindset, which again means, I look at any idea you can possibly throw at me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what idea it is, I will be able to find some value in it. So essentially what I'm gonna be doing today, like I said, is making the case that individualism is the proper existential starting place. I want to incorporate lots of elements of collectivism because I like to integrate all the best parts of every idea you possibly give me, and collectivism is like right underneath of it, right? Like individualism is the top. It's not to be trifled with, in my opinion, under any circumstance whatsoever. And right below it is collectivism. It's like barely below it. Like they should really be equals, but at the end of the day, in any given hierarchy, you can't have two things embodying the top because you have to make decisions. And if you're gonna make a decision, like the word decide literally means to kill off all options. So you kind of have to know which one you side with when push comes to shove. And when push comes to shove, I side with the individual rather than the collective. And I will break all that down. Just know that if you're a collectivist watching this, I love you too, I care about you, I'm glad that you're having the ideas that you have. I just think that if you want to have a more harmonious internal and external relationship, that is not the proper starting point. 
it's like if if individualism is a 10, collectivism is a nine, like right fucking underneath of it. So I still value everything you're having to say. Hopefully I can sway you to my side. At the very least, hopefully we can collaborate and create something meaningful together. So let's get into it. Now, the first thing that I'm not even gonna really go all that deep on, not until later anyway, is human rights only exist in an individualistic society. My body, my choice, that doesn't exist in a collectivist society. The ability to choose for yourself how you wanna live your life and how you wanna be, that only exists in an individualistic society. Your ability to speak freely, your ability to go out and write and create and do whatever it is you feel like doing as an individual, your ability to self-actualize as a living individual is only guaranteed to you in an individualistic society. In a collectivist society, you don't have that. At a certain point, you kind of stop being a person and you become a number and you become a part of a collective rather than a living, breathing human individual with rights and with feelings and all these different things that make up you as a person. So like I said, I'm not gonna go too deep into that right now, but hopefully that alone should probably let you know a little bit where I'm coming from and that this whole point I'm trying to make isn't completely bankrupt because if you like having rights, like I do, and if you like the ability to steer your own life in the direction of your choosing, and to love who you wanna love and live how you wanna live, then you know maybe give individualism a chance. So the second point that I wanna break down a little bit more in detail is the fact that collectives are made of individuals. And the health of the collective, the sanity of the collective, is dependent on the health and sanity of the individuals that inhabit that collective. So if you put the collective first, you are prioritizing that over the mental health, internal harmony, clarity, embodiment, and realization of the individuals within that collective. And that can lead to a lot of really kind of shitty experiences. Like me, I grew up in a really strict religious household, and so did a lot of other people that I know where you're essentially trained that you are not, on an individual level, the first and foremost thing. The church comes before you, God comes before you, whatever, the collective, all these different things, they come before you. And that leads to a lot of really bizarre things, right? Like I was raised in a family of Jehovah's Witnesses. And in that, you're taught to put pretty much everything else above yourself, right? There's, it's not a strong individualist culture and container. And as a result, even really early on in life, I looked around and I was like, why don't these motherfuckers sing? Why don't they dance? Why don't they make art? Why don't they create things? Why aren't, where's their spirit? Where's their heart? Where's their soul? Where's their humanity? They have traded their individualistic need for self-realization and creativity and that spark of life that is within them. They've traded that to fit into a collective. And it's so sad to me, it's heartbreaking and tragic. I don't think that's what we were meant to do here. Especially when you consider that if you get a whole bunch of people that live that way and you create a collective there, you have a, a collective that is soulless. And like, what a horrible thing to create. What a, what a terrible thing to do to yourself and the world around you. So when you take into consideration that collectives are made of specific individuals, it's like, well, what kind of individuals do you want in that collective? Do you want people that are connected to their heart and soul and that are able to express these things? People that are able to connect to an internal sense of right and wrong and act in alignment with those things. People that love themselves first and therefore learn how to love by the trial and error practice of shadow integration or anything else like I outline here. When you really put yourself first and learn to love yourself and figure out who you are, that is where internal harmony comes from. And a point I'm gonna make later is that ultimately leads to altruism. But if you wanna be in a collective of people that know who they are, and can live from the heart and express themselves and create and actually stand up for values that matter and make a difference in the world, well, then you need to encourage a healthy dose of individualism. So that's the first point that I'm gonna make. So to even kind of compound and build upon what I talked about prior to this is in my own personal opinion, there can be no higher aim than self-realization, both for yourself and the collective that you find yourself in, right? Because again, I told you, I lived in, uh, I grew up in a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, and self-realization is not really even a thing that they think about, let alone prioritize. It's, so it's very robotic. It's very just like, here's what the people that tell us what to think, think, and so here's what you think. And that's kind of prescribed, and you don't really get to say anything about it. And if you do say something about it, well, then you run the very big risk of being ousted from the community. And it's even important to acknowledge that my favorite place in the world, my favorite place to visit, the place that I eventually want to move, Japan, is a highly collectivistic or I don't know if that's even a word, is a highly collectivist mentality. And they're a collectivistic culture, if that is a word. And they have a good reason for it. They're an island culture that is prone to natural disasters, so they have to put other people in front of themselves. It makes sense to be that way. However, there are both really good and bad things about that culture that I want to illustrate. 
First, the really good things are it's safe as fuck. I was blown away by how safe it was. Here in America, where I live, you're nowhere near that safe. In Japan, you don't have to lock your bike up. You can just leave your shit and people don't take it. And shop owners don't have to take away all the merchandise from in front of their shop. They don't even have to fucking lock their shop up. Nobody's gonna take their shit. That, that's how safe it is when you ha live in a culture that puts everybody else first. It's kind of surreal and bizarre even to go to a place like that where you're so safe. It's, it's a little strange. Because everybody thinks about everybody else, everybody takes the time to make everything beautiful. So you will be walking through a dense urban population that's more dense than any area I've personally ever been, but everything is still beautiful. You may be walking through an endless amount of porches and balconies and all kinds of shit and whatever, but every person has taken the time to make their space beautiful and to increase the, the beauty of everything that everyone around them gets to see. Nobody creates an ugly space because they're constantly thinking about how it's gonna impact the collective and that's fucking beautiful. And I would never wanna get rid of that. That is something that I would truly love to integrate into my heart and into the heart of whatever culture and society I find myself in. However, that's pretty much where the benefits end because everything else is so detrimental to the human spirit that it is fucking alarming. As much as I love the Japanese people and as much as I love Japanese culture, it scares the shit out of me to see like, so when you go under the subway, there's like lines for people that are supposed to go this way. And then on the other side of the line, everybody's supposed to go this way. Here in America, it's a fucking free for all. We don't really pay attention to those lines and it's not that big of a deal. But in Japan, nobody fucking steps over that line. Like nobody does the thing they're not supposed to do. And that is just one small example of their highly repressive collectivist culture. Like another thing is that these motherfuckers have to work so hard in order to impress the boss and the collective and fit into the rules that they've been given by their society that they literally work themselves to death. You will find people asleep on the floor in the city and it's like, great, cool. Like, yeah, you're not gonna get robbed, that's fantastic. But at the same time, in order to appease a cultural thing that you don't have any say in and you can't fight against because your whole goddamn culture believes the same thing. And if you step out of line with what the culture says is good in this collectivist culture, you are ousted, you are treated like you don't really exist. Maybe you get fired, nobody wants to date you, your family doesn't like you anymore, all these horrible things. So there's this intense pressure to live inside of a collectivist mentality that isn't even fucking good for you, that doesn't honor you as an individual and makes you work so hard that suicide rates are insane. They have to work so hard that people aren't even dating anymore. Nobody's really even having sex there where the government will incentivize you to go have sex. They'll literally fucking pay you for it. Or at least they did a few years ago. I don't know if they're doing that anymore. And it just leads to this kind of like deadening of the soul. And it's fucking heartbreaking. In America, for all of our faults and all of our problems, even though we don't really have this all that much anymore, at our heart, we tried to be an incubator for self-realization. That, that's kind of what the American experiment was to a certain degree, is to be an incubator for self-realization. And I really don't think there can be any higher aim from that. Obviously we've strayed, obviously we've become corrupted and fucked ourselves in the foot, but creating some kind of incubator for self-realization to me, I think is the most meaningful thing that we can possibly do. And I wanna tell you why. Because here's what happens. I used to be someone with a more collectivist mindset. I used to be somebody who would think like, oh, fuck these rich people that are exploiting everybody else. They should not be allowed to exist. They should have to give all their money back and give it to all these people and blah, 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 blah. And that was my mentality growing up because I discovered punk rock when I was in sixth grade. That, was, that became my new religion. And the interesting thing about punk rock is half of it is highly individualistic and half of it is highly collectivist. So I got to really study a lot of these ideas since I was in sixth grade. This is why self-actualization is so important to me because I used to have all these old ideas about, you know, kill the rich and blah, 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 and whatever. I learned that as I did my shadow integration practice, that had nothing to do with morality. That had everything to do with the fact that I carried a lot of guilt and shame in me. And so anytime I did anything remotely selfish, even set a boundary, even state my needs, even tell people when they're hurting me, doesn't matter what it was, if I did anything even remotely selfish, it would trigger so much guilt and shame in me that I would feel like I was bad. Therefore, I couldn't do baseline selfish things like get enough money to take care of myself or state my needs so that people don't take, don't take advantage of me. So what I wanted was a culture that protected me from having to do those things. I didn't wanna to have to go make money, I wanted it handed it to me. I didn't want to create certain rules for myself or take responsibility for my existence. I wanted it done for me. And I didn't realize how big of a problem that was until I started doing my shadow integration practice. And I realized that my aversion to selfishness had absolutely nothing to do with morality. And it had everything to do with me escaping uh, guilt and shame. So as I started to embrace guilt and shame, 
and started to process and integrate those ideas, suddenly I was able to think for myself. I was able to ask the really important questions. Well, who do I want to be? What kind of man am I? What kind of life is going to make all the suffering of life worthwhile? What kind of life is going to be worth it for me? Who do I want to become? Like, what is the purpose of my life? That is a very individual question that you can only answer on an individual level. And the idea of a collective, like even coming close to prescribing that for a whole group of people just sickens me to my core because that's who you figure out who you really are and what your gift to the collective is. And so here's the really interesting thing is as I embrace my selfish side, yes, it felt terrible. And if that's all you do is embrace your selfish side, then like, yeah, you probably suck and you're probably gonna have a negative impact on the world around you. But if you're really trying to become self-actualized, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna integrate all internal opposites until they fit into a unique whole that can express itself as an individual being in harmony with itself, which is why Carl Jung called the integration process the individuation process. As you become more whole, as you integrate your internal opposites, you become more of an individual separate from the world around you. You become your own thing. Now there's a difference between being separate and disconnected. I am an individual that is separate from everyone else. I'm different than you. Even if we have a shitload of things in common, we will always see the world differently just a little bit. I am a unique individual. You are a unique individual. And as part of that, as we integrate opposites, the part of me that cares about me and the part of me that is selfish will ultimately have to be integrated with the part of me that cares about you and the part of me that cares about your family and honors your individuality and honors your sovereignty and has love for you both eventually have to get integrated. So if you go down the rabbit hole of selfishness from an integrative self-realized perspective or in the interest of becoming self-realized, what ends up happening is as you become more and more selfish in this, this way that I'm describing, you realize that being kind to other people and honoring the collective and giving to it as much as you can and providing value to it is actually the best thing to create harmony in your own internal world because you realize that everyone around you, the collective, still relates to you on an emotional level and you relate to them on an emotional level. Like the collective is a part of you. You relate to everything in your reality as on an emotional level. And so when you connect to another person, uh, to a huge degree, what you're connecting with is the part of you that relates to them, the part of you that resonates with them. And so when you think about the collective, a lot of times what you're connecting to is the part of you that relates to the collective, the part of you that resonates with the collective, the part of you that connects with the collective. So when you are really interested in becoming self-actualized and integrating all the different parts of yourself and integrating all unique opposites, you realize that you cannot hurt the collective without hurting yourself. And you cannot love yourself without, as an extension, loving the collective. So individualism on itself, when done in this healthy way, which I know we're not doing, I know we haven't largely done to a large degree, I know we're still fucking getting there, but I'm still making my point, is that if you go and follow that to its natural end, you get to altruism. You get to a care for the collective that is natural. It's authentic, it's autonomous, it doesn't have to be forced. Nobody has to tell you, to be like, hey, don't do that bad thing. You just know that if I hurt this other person, what I'm really doing is hurting myself. And if I love this other person, what I'm really doing is loving myself and vice versa, which is the law of correspondence from hermetic philosophy, which is my own personal favorite philosophy. The law of correspondence is where you get the quote, as above, so below, as within, so without, which basically means I can't hurt you without hurting me and I can't love me without loving you. So if you take individualism to its logical end, you ultimately get to altruism, but it's a healthy, non-forced, autonomous, genuine altruism where you're doing it because you see why it's good and you see the harm that anything else would do and you don't wanna do that because it simply doesn't make sense to you. However, if you create a collectivist society where you don't allow people, maybe not even allow, like maybe collectivist society could allow for that, right? But if you don't hold that as sacred, and if you don't hold that as never to be infringed upon, and if you don't hold that as the number one thing to be celebrated and supported, well then you, you, you don't have a group of people that have done that. You don't create a container that allows or incentivizes people to go through that process. Instead, you give them a set of rules and say, this is how you relate to the collective, this is what you do, blah, 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 and then they just have to obey it. There's no room for self-actualization. I mean, it's not that there's no room, but it's just the self-actualization piece should be prioritized first so that you can get to that end result. Where if you put the collective first, then like, where are you gonna actualize? How are you gonna do that? The priority, like we see in Japanese culture and some other cultures around the world, especially in like people who've tried communism, right? Like a few different places this has been tried. 
And I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into the political elements of this because it's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is point to the fact that when you create a collectivist mentality, you prescribe a way of thinking for everybody, and those who don't fit into it are outcasted. Sometimes they're fucking killed. They're cast out. Bad things happen to the people that don't fit into right think, which ends up being group think. And who the fuck do you think gets to decide what the group think is? The people in charge, people you don't want to be making those decisions. So when you allow somebody to have that kind of power, it, it comes at the cost of self-actualization, at least to a degree. And that degree that which it comes at the cost of self-actualization is not a cost I'm willing to pay. Because if you prioritize self-realization at the top, eventually you get to the other thing. But if you prioritize collectivism over the individual, you don't get that sense of self-actualization. Maybe some people will take it on. Maybe some people will go against the grain, but it won't be encouraged. It won't be incentivized. It won't be rewarded. And one of the things I love the most about American culture, in spite of all of its flaws, is that if you figure out who the fuck, which is what I've done, if you figure out who the fuck you are, what your gifts are, and how to give them to the world around you to the best of your ability, you will be rewarded. That is the way our system is set up. Love it or hate it, I love capitalism for the fact that I was able to say, who am I? What is my gift to the world? What is the problem I can solve? What is the best way I can be of service and create value for the world around me? And let me go all in on that. Let me devote my entire fucking life to that so I can be the best at it and trust that if I truly provide value for the world around me, I will be rewarded and I will be given a life that I desire the more I self-actualize and the more I use that as a vehicle to give value to the world around me. That is goddamn beautiful. I can't imagine anything better than that. Obviously, we need a little bit of collectivist ideas to take care of the people that fall through the cracks or the people that don't have the stability to do the inner work that I did. There's obviously flaws. There's obviously reasons to integrate collectivism into it. But ultimately, the, the, the emphasis should be put on the individual so that we're all given the opportunity to figure out who the fuck we are, what our gift to the world is, and how to give it. Now, like I said, you could give people things like universal basic income. You could give people certain things to a certain degree to meet their baseline needs of uh, Maslow's hierarchy so that they can start to do this inner work. There's a good argument for that, and I wouldn't disagree with you. The only thing I would care about is to make sure that the individual is still valued over anything else, that we honor and revere the individual for what it is. Because when you get into what an individual is and what their heart is and what they're capable of creating, it's fucking incredible. It's mind-blowing when you really get into what an individual human is how they work, their connection to reality, their connection to nature, their connection to other people, uh, their ability to manipulate reality seemingly by magic. Like it's, it's unfucking believable what an individual human being is and what they're capable of. And to, to not honor that above all else is just a goddamn tragedy. Like yes, absolutely honor the collective. Make sure people have enough security and stability in order to ask these really big questions. For sure, I'm with you there. But goddamn. Make sure the individual is prioritized. Make sure that it is honored. Make sure that it is held sacred because that is what you are. If you want to figure out who the fuck you are and what your gift to the world is, you're going to have to do that on an individual level. Only you can program your mind. Only you can ask yourself these questions. Only you can figure out who you are and act on it. Only you can overcome trauma because even if you are given all the safety and security in the world, people still die. You know, like I was born into a pretty safe and stable home, but my dad just fucking died. You, you, you can't escape trauma. You're going to become traumatized because the world is a dangerous, scary place where shitty things happen to good people every single day. No matter how much you're well taken care of, you're not gonna be able to avoid trauma. And overcoming trauma is an individual thing. Like yes, if you're surrounded by really good people, it can make it a hell of a lot easy, easier, but ultimately anybody who's in a position like mine where you try and help people, you know that you cannot help people that don't want to be helped. You know you cannot help people that are not willing to be helped and ready to be helped and ready to face the pain and ask themselves difficult questions and be willing to move through all those things. So even if you have a healthy collective, it is still up to the individual to decide to face their pain and decide to ask themselves the serious questions and who the fuck they're gonna become. That is something that only you can do. And if a collective were to encourage those things and prioritize those things, Fucking A, that's what I want. I'd be stoked about that. Something that I want to talk about that is kind of like one of the downsides of individualism that I kind of want to be honest about is that it comes with a huge responsibility, right? Like in order to be a member of an individualistic society that's going to work, you have to take on your individual responsibilities. You actually have to say, all right, it's on me to become a person. It's on me to ask who the fuck I want to be and where I want to go. 
It's on me to program my mind the way I want it to be. And it's ultimately on me to figure out what my value is and how I wanna provide that to my collective in a meaningful way that they're actually gonna benefit from and want to use my services more than anything else. I wanna be able to be the one that provides the best value to my community. That's a responsibility you have to willingly take on yourself. It's not something that's prescribed to you and it's not something that I think should be prescribed to you. So as a potential downside, it does come with a lot of responsibility and it comes with the willingness to ask yourself very difficult questions and face very difficult emotions. But ultimately that's some of the most meaningful shit you can do. So that responsibility is really only a downside for people that don't want to take responsibility for their realities. And there's plenty of good reasons to not want to do that. Most of them are trauma-based, but a lot of them are understandable, right? Like I didn't want to take responsibility for my life because when my dad died when I was a little kid, I got the idea that the world is a scary, dangerous, chaotic, terrible place that could do awful things to me at any moment and there's nothing I could do about it. So for me, in my little child brain, I was like, that sounds fucking terrible. I don't want any part of that. So growing up with that, until I took responsibility for my own psychological makeup, I was averse to being a part of the world. I was averse to figuring out who I am and how I wanted to be in the world and what I wanted to create within it. And the, I had good reasons. I was fucking traumatized. Like I was a little kid, you know? Like I didn't ha really have too much control at the time over what worldview I would create when faced with death at six years old. And there's a lot of other people with way worse circumstances that are way more understandable that make them averse to taking on these responsibilities. In which case I would lean on the collectivist motherfuckers to be like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, let's work with you. Let's figure out what we can do for these people that fall through the cracks. I'm not opposed to that. I don't want one or the other. I want both integrated into a uh, unified whole to create harmony between the two. I just, again, just want to make sure that individualism, is, it, that individualism is prioritized over the collective. But also at the same time, that responsibility is needed, right? Because this is one of the other things that I really like about American culture and America as a country in general. Again, we have our flaws. I'm never gonna say that we don't. And the founding fathers had their flaws. That's not the point here. Because if, if you take a look at America and if you take a look at the founding fathers and all you see is bad, then you have a really wasteful attitude and you're not really even looking for value. In fact, you probably got told by someone with an ideological slant that that's how it is and you probably didn't look any further. So what I wanna encourage you to do is look a little further. Because one of the things that I really love about America and one of the things that I love about the Founding Fathers, again, despite their, their shit, is that they knew that human systems, humans, governments, organizations, all sort of shit, it leans toward tyranny because we are imperfect humans, at least at this stage in our development. We are human beings. We are imperfect human beings that will and can lead towards tyranny more often than not. That's why they say absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you get into a situation like this, you need a group of people that see the way that society goes as their responsibility. When you see the way that society goes as up to the collective, you don't take a personal stake in it. You don't take a personal interest in the steering of your culture and making sure that it goes somewhere healthy and making sure of all these different things. You don't have that responsibility baked into your ecosystem and baked into your DNA that you would if you lived in an individualistic society, which is why we have freedom of speech. We are the only country that, has, at least to my knowledge, we are the only country that has this. The ability to speak out against your own government is codified by law. Nobody else has that. That is a very individualistic idea and it's fucking beautiful. Freedom of the press, the ability for the newspaper to say, hey, fuck our president. He's being a dickhead, you know, like, because the thing is power changes, right? So even if you create a collectivist society where there has to be a power structure, somebody has to be at the top, and like with Russia, even if you get the good guy, like Lenin was a pretty good dude, wasn't as bad as he could have been, right? He gets fucking murdered and the most psychopathic, terrible piece of shit takes his place. That is humanity leaning towards tyranny. That is humanity leaning towards corruption. You have to understand that eventually that shit is going to happen because that's who we are as people. And so a society that doesn't take that into consideration, like again, it's not all of who we are. We're not just evil, we're not just bad, but we have enough propensity for it where especially when you take into consideration like who rises easiest. Like the psychopaths will do things that everyone else won't do. That's why they get power quicker than everyone else. That's why they do all these fucking things is because if you're a psychopath that doesn't have to worry about empathy or compassion or remorse or anything like that, you can do whatever shady bullshit you have to do to get yourself to the fucking top. And then if power is centralized and you don't have a group of strong individualistic people to combat that shit, well then you're fucked. You got nowhere to go from there. However which is, this is how America was supposed to be, 
if we start to lean towards tyranny, us as individuals, we're supposed to do something about that. It is in the Constitution. You have a right and an obligation as an American to overthrow the government if it gets tyrannical. You are supposed to do that. The Founding Fathers told you to do that. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not going to tell you to do that. But I am going to tell you that the Founding Fathers wanted you to do that. And it's in the fucking Constitution. It's not my fault if you get mad at me. Read the Constitution. That is what they were supposed to what they said you were supposed to do. They're like, look, bro, we're eventually going to fuck this up. Eventually, someone's going to come around and be a tyrannical dickhead, and it's on you guys to do something about that. You are strong, sovereign individuals. You are goddamn Americans, and you are supposed to fix this. It's our responsibility. Now, whether or not we take up that responsibility is a completely different thing. Now, it's important to acknowledge that a lot of people aren't ready for this responsibility. Some of us aren't capable of this responsibility, and that's fine. Again, totally okay integrating a little bit of collectivism in to make sure that this works, I just want to make sure that I always live in a place where my sovereignty, my voice, my heart, my spirit, my ability to express myself however I choose, even if you don't like it, especially if you don't like it, my ability to be who I am, regardless of what the world around me says, I want to make sure that that is never taken away from me. And I want to make sure it's never taken away from you. Like, look at what the fuck happened. You know, like we had this whole like my body, my choice thing. Imagine if you had no way to fight for that. Imagine if speaking out against that was illegal. Imagine if writing articles about it was illegal. You don't have to deal with that as an American. You get to fucking, you can like talk shit on the president on SNL every fucking week and no one's gonna do anything to you. Look at what's happening in Iran right now. They can't do that. Look what happens in Venezuela. They can't do that. All these other places that don't have individual rights codified as sacred, horrible things happen and they can't do anything about it. They can't write about it. They can't fight it with any legal means. So individualism is fucking essential. It's a big responsibility, like I said, and you have to ask yourself whether or not you're really ready and willing to take on that responsibility. But honestly, I would rather have that responsibility than fucking anything else. I would rather have that responsibility and the freedom that comes along with it than give up that responsibility and that challenge for safety. You know, Benjamin Franklin said, those who would trade security for safety are, deser are, are deserving of neither. And that's kind of harsh. It's a little more harsh than I would put it. But I think... A better way to say it is if you give up freedom for security, you just end up with neither, right? Like whoever you give it up to, eventually someone will become corrupt and whatever you gave your freedom for, whatever form of security you gave it for will eventually be used against you. Maybe not, maybe the guy who convinced you to do it was good. Maybe that's fine. But then the, who's the guy that takes his place? Just like what happened with Russia. Maybe, maybe Lenin's not that bad, you know? Maybe he could be worse. Not the worst one I've ever seen in my life. But who fucking took his place? Who forcibly took his place by murdering him and taking over. That's what happens. That's what people do. That's why America has eventually become corrupt. That's why every structure we're ever gonna create, if not taken into responsibility, who we are as people and the proclivities that we have towards corruption and tyranny and evil, if those are not taken into consideration, they will eventually own us, which is the whole point of shadow integration. It's not like you're just entirely a dickhead. It's just that you have an angel and a demon in you. And if you pretend that you're only an angel, well, then the things that the demon does is going to take you by surprise. You're going to be caught off guard. And you're going to be like, what the fuck? How did that happen? I'm not that person. Boo hoo, woe is me. But the reality of the fact is you were already both from the very beginning, but you didn't want to accept the duality of man. You didn't want to embrace your proclivity and potential for tremendous good as well as tremendous evil. And if you do that on a personal level, your shadow will get the best of you which is why people listen to me in the first place because all this shit happens and everybody knows it. Self-sabotage, fucking up all your relationships, accidentally hurting someone that you really love. All these things happen because you have a little demon in you that is trying to tear your life apart and it's trying to make things worse. For whatever reason, we all have this. And if you don't own that in yourself, that little demon will wreak havoc in your reality. And if, you, and if a bunch of people show up not honoring that capacity in themselves and on a collective level, the collective consciousness doesn't acknowledge their proclivity proclivity for uh, tyranny and corruption and all these sorts of things, then all of a sudden you have that shit in your collective cultural shadow and then what do you think is gonna happen? The demon's gonna show up when you least expect it in ways that you didn't see coming and you won't be fucking ready to handle it. So if you want to self-actualize, you have to take both sides of yourself into consideration and be able to create harmony between the two. Understand why they exist, the purpose that they're meant to serve and all these sorts of things. And then if you do that with enough of us, creating a collective based on that shared understanding, well, then you've got something that should be really harmonious. Because what I notice is the more I get my internal world into harmony, my external world becomes more harmonious as, as a result. Because all the parts of myself that relate to all these external factors become healthier. So therefore, instead of seeing a person 
that like is a threat to me and like maybe I'll project my jealousy onto or my insecurities or like my rage at my dad, you know, instead of seeing like some big strong guy being like, oh, you remind me of my dad and I don't like my dad, so you're a bad guy. Instead of doing that, I love the part of me that's like might be still mad at my dad and therefore I'm able to love that guy and not project my bullshit onto him. Same with like seeing chicks and being like, oh, you're just like my mom. And it's like, no, bro, like my mom was like my mom. So let me integrate the part of me that says all that, be able to see people for who they really are and embrace them and interact with them on a much healthier level. That's what happens when you embrace yourself as an individual and first and foremost see that like, okay, I am an individual. My reality is individual to me. I have programmed it in a very subjective, unique and individual way. And so therefore I'm perceiving things in a unique and individual way. And if I want to address the way that I perceive things, it has to be done on the individual way as well. So this is everything I really wanted to say about this. Hopefully you at least understand where I'm coming from. Hopefully this at least makes sense to you. What I really would love is to encourage as many of you as possible to embrace yourself as an individual. Even if it doesn't take the, the cake as the top thing in your values hierarchy, I really hope you can see the power and the importance of, of honoring yourself as an individual. Hopefully you honor yourself as an individual first so that you can really get clear on who you are, so that you can clean up your relationship with yourself, that you can see your external reality as an extension of your internal reality, take full and complete responsibility for it, and start to clean up the world around you by cleaning up the world inside of you and start creating a healthier collective by becoming a healthier member of that collective and allowing those attitudes and those energies and all those little subtle things you can't even take into consideration, allowing those to create healthy ripples in your environment that will hopefully inspire other people to do the same. Because when you are a whole, healthy, stable, and internally harmonious person, you end up unconsciously creating harmony, or harmony and peace and love and, and, and all these things. You end up creating these incredible ripples that like, you, you can't even take into, you can't even imagine like the ripples that your smile could have on the world, if it's truly genuine. You can't, un you can't underestimate the power of real true self-sourced kindness on somebody that really needs it that day. Or like being able to, to have a, a healthy conversation with another person who's maybe never been related to in a certain way. Like you can't underestimate those things. And obviously collectives can teach you to do those things, but when you do them for yourself, and when you do them for their own merit, because you want to be healthy and you want to be whole and it's true and genuine and you don't have to like fight the parts of you that maybe you want to think otherwise, because when, when you just follow a prescribed set of rules, it's like there's, there's going to be parts of you that don't fit into that. There's going to be part of you that don't believe that or don't agree with it. And you're going to be at war with those parts. And it's going to be difficult to integrate them into a thing because you, you won't have the freedom to think. You won't have the freedom to act. You won't be able to experiment, see what works and what doesn't, and ultimately how to integrate it in the collective. You're not allowed that. You're not afforded that. And it's certainly not encouraged. So I really just want to encourage you to see the value and the beauty of seeing yourself as an individual and to love yourself and get yourself into harmony and truly see that as the best gift that you can give for your collective. Love your collective. Tell me how we can do better in honoring the collective. Tell me how I can do better in honoring the collective. And I will integrate that because I care about making sure that any part of me that resonates with any idea you're ever going to share with me for the rest of my life is integrated so I can know that part, so I can find the value in it and use it for my own betterment and then extend that to the world around me. So again, I, <laughs> this isn't to really shit on anyone's ideas or to say the collectivism is bad. It's just to say that like, I don't know that you've ever really necessarily thought about it this way. I don't know that you've ever been presented with these particular ideas and seen how beautiful and powerful you are as an individual and what the fuck you are capable of creating by yourself. That's what I want you to know is the beauty and majesty that you are as an individual human being and to really embrace that and to really fall in love with that and to see what somebody who embraces and falls in love with themselves as an individual and really it has this harmonious integrator of the collective as well. Like what someone like that is capable of creating on the collective level, it's just fucking incredible. So let me know if you have any other questions about this. Let me know if there's any other side topics I should go into. This is probably good for now. I love you. I'm Chris Orozco, and I'll see you next time.